Hey class, Mr. G here to Because I'm by myself. There's nobody here. Welcome class, Mr. G here. I'm your instructor for this term. We're going over some ceramics and right now we're talking about part B of my ceramics class, which is a little more advanced than the first part, but don't worry, we're gonna walk you guys through it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. As I said, I'm Mr. G. I am your instructor for this term. Now, this is for my students as well as other teachers because I put it up on my channel. So giving you guys a brief overview on how I take care of this class for my ceramics class. So it's kind of like a ceramics two, or for me, it's a part B uh, because we have a weird semester thing going on where I'm at. First off, part A, what did we cover? Well, we covered the basics of ceramics, which is slab, uh, sorry, which is pinch, coil and slab, the basic building blocks on how we construct in clay. All you need to know is already on my channel, just go to the playlist, it says like ceramics on it or ceramics and sculpture. Watch my videos, I go over everything there. So quickly, you can be easily caught up. Again, most of my stuff is on YouTube, why? Because it's so much easier. Let's go over with what you guys are gonna be covering this year, this term, as well as kind of an overview on how I grade, because that's important because you weren't like, how am I gonna pass the class? So now, first off, I have designed this course with the virtual student in mind, because uh, this, most students are opting of not coming in, they wanna stay virtual, which, you know, you, you make your decision, I fully support the decision that you guys wanna make, if you wanna be here, wanna be home, totally understand. With that in mind, I am designing all of my stuff for the virtual student because I have more of those. Now, with that said, I want you guys to be to know up front that this class is built around materials and having tools and different things that you're going to need. So I have to find a new way to ensure that all my students are to make all their projects without a lot of fuss. That's number one, because I guarantee somebody at, you know, you guys at home don't have a kiln in the back or one of those massive paper cutters, which is really handy to have. Or a mat cutter, because I'm using that a lot this term for some reason. With that said, I'm trying to design everything that we're doing for the virtual student. So up front. First off, let's go over a little bit about the grading process and what we're gonna be doing before we go into what we're the covering this term. All right, so first off, how do I grade? Projects, that's the big thing that we do in here. We, I'm a production artist, we make a lot of pieces. I make a lot of pieces at the same time. I'm a big proponent of make your own work, sell your work after you make it. Um, that's my mentality. And so I push that on you guys just the same. I'm not, um, I'm not like Snape toned to page 974. I'm, I'm not that, so we're making the stuff. On this project, you have three major grades that we do. First off is the sketch. So you are going to need a sketchbook of some form or fashion. I personally use a lot of composition notebooks. So if you want to use a composition notebook, perfectly fine. If you want a sketchbook, get one of these bad boys. Uh, you know, nice big, um, it's like a 12 by 9 size bigger than the composition. I, I like a little more space when I'm working. These things, a few bucks. Uh, if you go into like Hobby Lobby or Michaels or Walmart, Walgreens, Target, wherever you pretty much can buy notebooks and paper, they sell it. Maybe even Home Depot. I don't know. I haven't really looked too hard. Uh, before you go into some of those stores, there's an ad in the front that has like a 40% off coupon. If they have that, use it. It's free money. Save, save, yourself, save yourself some, some coin. So once you have the sketch done, then we're going into the build phase. So the sketch is one grade, the build phase is another grade. Depending on the project, this does take up more than one grade, but just rule of thumb, three grades so that it's easy to process. So how you guys are building the pieces themselves and how you guys are constructing stuff. Now for me, let me tell you up front, when you're building your piece, take lots of pictures. I have my phone on me all the time. I'm using it to take pictures of the work as it's in progress because um, as we're getting towards the end of the term and we're going over units, one of the things is social media. You're gonna need those pictures uh, later on down the road too. Once you've done your sketch, you've done your build, now we're at the final, the thing is done, it's completed, it's ready to turn in and say, here you go, Mr. G, I've made my project. That's your third grade, okay? So sketch, build, final piece, all done. That's the nutshell of how to think about the projects. Next, we have the art history. Now, art history is the biggest equalizer for my class because students will either pass my class and do just fine or you will fail miserably and it's because you didn't do art history. So most of the students who end up failing my classes because they failed to do their art history. So 
and I'm saying it a lot because it's it's a big it's a big section of grade. Now, for me, art history is once a week. That's it. I don't cover it more than that. I really kind of just touch base on it, and I use it as a uh, jumping off platform, a building platform for you guys to get some more ideas for your own work. Now, for me, the B section I enjoy more because all my artists are living artists. A section we deal with the dead people, so Da Vinci, Picasso, Raphael, maybe sometimes we we do we do the uh, the whole turtle thing, uh, Raphael, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and uh, Donatello, which is funny because Donatello was not part of the Renaissance. They could have researched it more. That's all I'm saying. I, mean, I, I understand, like it sounds good, marketing campaign, get that, but. Bruncelli or Botticelli. No, Botticelli, Caravaggio. You have a couple other options. These guys just, another topic down the road. For the art history, you have three things that you guys are gonna cover. For me, I have like a map, let's put up a map here. That slide you see is the art history. That's it, in a nutshell, that's all we do. Uh, you have the single image that we look at as our reference point. I tell you the title, the artist, and the period. As I said, A section, we do dead people. B section, I do living artists. I'm online all the time. I look for artists that are living, that are creating works currently, that have a YouTube channel sometimes because I wanna watch and see how they made stuff. And that is fun for me, but it also gives you a completely different look into the art world as a whole. Case in point, I had a student who we were doing a project. Uh, this was like a couple years back. And I saw Louis Hover, and I'm pretty certain he's out of Australia. I forgot because we haven't talked in a while. But I, I saw his work and I was like, this would be great to work as, a, do a project on something like this in class and we can use color and line and, and do different different things that we can use. And I started doing it, Did my had my students do their pieces. I put it in my feed of, uh, when I threw up stuff for, for my classes and the artist hit me back. He hit me back and, and I put on the, the uh, my student, because most of my students are older, and I put her, I tagged her in the work and he hit her up and like, your work is awesome, love it. So to have the artist hit you back and tell you that your work is awesome, that's just good. Oh, that, oh, warm and tingly inside, so nice. Love doing current artists, love doing real uh, living artists because it's just more fun to do, uh, which makes the three things that we're doing so much simpler. So the first thing that you're doing is the description. You're listing six, minimum six, things that you see in the overall image. So you're just creating a simple list of what you see. Next one, interpretation. Why did the artists make the choices they made? What, what's, what are they saying with this work? Living artists, these guys have blogs, YouTube channels, they're talking about this, there's a press tour. They're, they're going over why they did stuff, which is important for us as artists to know what your inspiration was, where was it coming from? Why did you have this these feelings? And then all you're doing is telling me your opinion as to, uh, you're taking that bit of research and you're compiling it and condensing it together and then telling me a little story of why they made that kind of piece. Because you might find the blog that says, this is why I made this piece. Don't cut and paste, paraphrase, reword it a little bit into your own words, but you know, you get the gist. And last one there is judgment. Now judgment, you either like the piece or don't like the piece. I have a lot of artwork that I like and I have a lot of artwork I have really, really strong I I detest some of this stuff. And that's fine. I want to know that opinion. I wanna know why you have that opinion. So if you start off with, I like this piece, that's fine. But it should have a comma. And then you tell me a little bit of large chunk of whether you like, why you like or dislike the piece. So like if you see a piece of artwork, let's throw up, mm, George Seagal. He's not alive. Yeah, he's dead. So you can't see an interview where he's talking about the work. He, he did do interviews during his life. And his work focuses a lot on the Holocaust and I appreciate his work. I actually like some of his work, but at the same time, I hate some of his work. And it's not because of a dislike for the work, but it's the concept of what the work represents. The Holocaust was such a horrifically awful thing. Um, I, I will tell you now, I went to DC, this was years ago, it was back in the, back in the nineties and they opened up the Holocaust Memorial Museum and you walk through that, that left a, that left a scar on me there. It was horrifically awful. It is one of the best experiences I've ever had because of how much the history came to life in that exhibit. And it was absolutely horrifically awful. 
but at the same time as a, as a just an art artist and an educator i'm looking at that thinking that is the most brilliant thing i've ever seen mentally and in, internally myself it was just absolutely horrifically awful um so i'm conflicted to say the least but it was but that's important to state because it gives a conversation it creates a something for us to have a discussion about and that's what's important that's what i want to reiterate to all of my students so how are you bringing that personality into your own work that you have these thoughts these feelings these ideas how are you bringing that into your own work what is that work trying to say so using other artists as a as that first jump into the deep end and using that as that build process it's great use that help help work through somebody else's pain to create some works on your own or use their inspiration of things that were awesome in their life to make better pieces yourself it's good stuff finally test test is a really weird thing right now because we're in the whole virtual space i don't like tests in the virtual space in general just because there's a lot of testing irregularities that could happen and because of that things get wonky for me anyways i have to do a pre and post test some people call it a benchmark some people have it as a pre and post test some places they call it the student learning objectives that was a state person who mandated that term we have acronyms for everything in education if you're giving somebody a slow test that's bad that was i don't know who came up with that term but that was a that's a bad five minutes you could have come up with something better Just five more minutes keep we're gonna let you let you think about that one for a minute come back to us when you got better better answer but yeah so these tests these benchmarks these assessments where we're assessing how you do on the front end to the back end how you're doing that's what the test is for legally the pretest tells us what you don't know so if you don't know anything that's fine on the pretest you get a zero that's cool on the post test you get a hundred you did amazing but if you got like a 90 on the pretest and you get like a 40 on the post test something happened go in there with the information of knowing what a pretest and post test is that's the only thing i, I kind of want to stress to to my students as well as other students that have to do the whole assessment thing that's what they're te testing on they want to know how well you you did over the course so if you do bad at the beginning and do awesome at the end you're fine we also do a midterm midterm for me is usually a, a additionary project element where we're just adding stuff to the project and use that as a midterm grade uh and the reason i do that is because as i said before the whole virtual thing and doing a test in the virtual space to me is just kind of a weird it's, it's weird if i'm in the classroom and we can do it as like a, a vocabulary kind of thing it works and yes i know i could do that as a midterm test we got enough going on right now i'd rather work on the projects instead of worry about one single test because that one single test is not going to outweigh four projects just saying mathematically it doesn't make any sense for ceramics class these are the units that we're going to be covering this term first off we got sculpture then we got mixed media then we got portfolio development all right let's go ahead and dive into some of those projects now now for ceramics as i said before we're going to be covering three different types of, of units for this term first one there is sculpture next one is mixed media finally we're going to deal with some portfolio development now for sculpture creating forms in 2d and 3d this is the base element of what we're going to be doing structurally for sculpture first off I saw this project i thought hey let's give this a go and that is coiled ceramic tiles um for this these designs are going to be animal focused so that's kind of the theme that we're going to be going into first i might change that into something else but right now i'm going to work with animals just because it's simple and uh and we can get something cool out of that first off now i know this is clay when i say coils i've got a paper version as well or uh plastics depending on uh what we have access to so again, all these projects are de designed with the virtual student in mind. The animal tiles, we're gonna be working on additive and subtractive sculptures, sculptural techniques. And this is where you're adding elements together to create a sculptural form, or you have a block of something and you're taking pieces off subtractively to create the form from the underneath elements. So we're going over a little bit of both of those. Again, I gotta fine tune uh, the project elements um, in a, in a couple weeks so as we're going forward i'll give that to you guys 
Next one there, mixed media. So for mixed media, really for this one, because it's ceramics class, I've got to touch on glaze chemistry and glaze application. So all the pieces, the other pieces that we've done so far, now we're getting into how are we going to decorate and design these to create the best um, final version. So this part is where things start to overlap a lot more. Um, now for the glaze chemistry, I'm just doing a straight up glaze components that we normally have inside the classroom but we're doing the color component in sketchbooks and we're going to be and you guys are going to write that stuff out so how do how does glaze work in general so what are the components of glaze and some of the elements that you guys need to know um what they're going to do inside of fire but again i this, this is more of a lecture kind of thing and i'll be going over that with you so like I said before, the whole test thing is kind of weird for me, um, but we might have something digital, maybe like a Kahoot or something like that to make it make it as interesting as possible. Finally, there is your portfolio development. Now, under portfolio development, I do I have two things listed. First one is social media. So I'm going over with how to structure the images that you guys have been taking over the course of the term and then how we're going to be applying those online so how are you creating a digital portfolio of your own work how are you getting your message out there the stuff that you create how are you being a forward-thinking artist um because i'll be honest with you especially doing youtube you can't do anything in this world without a hustle and i hustle all of my youtube videos i hustle my artwork i use my social media platforms to help build upon all those things that i already work on and we're just kind of going over the fine-tuned features of how much you have to do that as an artist in general as well as a, kind of a, somebody in this society today you have to be able to hustle all the stuff that you do no one is going to know that you posted anything unless you kind of put it in their face and I'm I'm 100% awful at this because of how much I do on a weekly basis. The hustle is is hard. And the hustle is real, and you got to do it if you want to get if you want to get get stuff out there. Uh, and last one there is your independent project. Every student has an independent project of things that you're going to create that are isolated to your own thing. What do you want to build? What do you want to create? And then what path are you going to do to uh, moving that forward? So we'll go into that a lot more in depth as we get to that bridge. Awesome guys, I hope that gave you a really good overview as to what we're gonna be covering this term as a whole. And for my teacher friends, it, I hope that gave you guys some good guidance on just kind of how I do my stuff. Might give you guys some ideas. If you have some better ideas, by all means, put that down in the comments below. Always like to get feedback from, from other teacher friends or students. If you guys saw something that you, um, well, I think this would be better toss that down there always happy to read that kind of stuff uh wrapping up for my my class um i look forward to a good term for you guys if you guys have any questions as always feel free to hit me up either text email or this if it makes it easier for you whichever is fine with me oh for uh, my teacher friends uh google voice is great nice way to keep yourself anonymous online and uh having a having a viable number that people can contact business or whatnot it's a good thing good option to have i do give out some sort of personal contact for me which is the google voice number uh you guys have access to my email and you have um for me we use teams microsoft teams uh have that to have access to get me questions if you guys have questions on anything that you guys have that's how you get in touch with me uh wrapping up for my teacher friends and uh my other classmates that are out in in the virtual space of youtube don't forget to like subscribe and share on all the various platforms get the message out there to as many teachers and students and everybody in the world as you possibly can always good to have more classmates there uh, don't forget, if you guys had a question, comment, or concern during the video today, don't forget to raise the hands down in the comments below. Happy to answer those class those questions from those classmates. And as always, I'll see you guys next class. So until then, later, guys.